What a wonderful building and a great opportunity to be here. Um, I am uh, podium phobic, so I, I will apologize to you uh, if you can't see me, um, but I, I'm more comfortable here, so I'll talk from here. Um, as, as, uh, as was said before, my name is Shai Gassi. I'm the founder and CEO of Better Place. I'm uh, an Imagineer. I imagine the future and engineer towards it. And a lot of people have this tendency to do engineering forward, in which case we're bound by the, what we see around us. And, uh, and a lot of people tend to do imagining, which is sort of the, uh, I've been blamed to be only imagining, which is sort of the Disney thing, is uh, hope for the best and, uh, and it will happen. And I don't believe in either. I don't believe in imagining without engineering. I don't believe with engineering just within the constraints of what we do today. You have to have both if you want to solve big problems, and you can't apply the methods that got us into trouble to getting us out of trouble. We're, um, we're very lucky to have a situation today where we have created a glorious, glorious disaster. Um, we have uh, the entire planet climate um, changing on us at speeds that we have not seen before. We are running out of oil. The entire car industry is falling apart. The economy is uh, in a global recession. Jobs are short. Um, and it's such a great opportunity because you can't solve one of these elements and ignore the other ones. We cannot solve for the car industry by creating um, more cars of the past. That won't work. We cannot solve uh, climate by destroying the economy even more. We can't save the economy but then destroy the planet because 10 years from now, what good would it do us? So we have to start thinking in holistic ways and we have to start asking ourselves the real big tough questions. And we have to solve for them at scale. It's not good enough to go build one electric car. It's not good enough to build one beautiful green building. We have to start asking the real big questions. So I got tackled with, uh, with an enormous question, one of those open-ended um, conversational starters you shouldn't throw at a 40-year-old because they create a midlife crisis. Um, how are you going to make the world a better place by 2020? Open-ended, but limited in time. And I came back from that question at a World Economic Forum in 2005 with another question in my mind. How would you run an entire country without gasoline, but without altering the way we live? Not by forcing people not to drive, but not by changing the way we build cities, but in a way that is pragmatic, based on the science that we have off the shelf, not in some lab, in some research somewhere down the road, without inventing new economics and working within the confines of consumer tastes as we know them today. How would you run an entire country without gasoline? It took me the better part of two years to come up with an answer. I went down every possible mistake. Um, I started thinking it will be biofuels. And I ran through six months of assessing every possible biofuels and realizing at the end of the day, with all the incentives and everything that was put in place, in places like uh, the US, for example, we generate five days worth of driving from biofuels. And the other 360, you know how we say there are 360 days in a year? It's the other five that we do with biofuels, and the other th 360 we did with oil. Um, and that's with massive investments to the tune of about $90 billion over the last five years. Um, and realizing that, in this case, it just doesn't scale. I went down hydrogen. I was absolutely positively sure it will be hydrogen, uh, only to realize that that's probably the stupidest idea ever invented by mankind. You take an electron, you pack it with a proton that's 2,000 times bigger, you send it all the way to the car, you build a whole new infrastructure at hundreds of billions of dollars only to strip the proton from the electron and use the electron at the car. That's not a smart idea given the fact that we built the grid, man's greatest accomplishment, that actually knows how to send the electron without the proton. In that case, why do you pack it? And that brought me to the idea that actually the only way to do it is by going directly to electrons. And you need to build an electric car an infrastructure that will solve the issue for an electric car. That created our base hypothesis. In other words, we translated the question, how do you run an entire country without gasoline, to the following hypothesis. It will sound almost stupid in its simplicity. But interestingly enough, nobody's ever answered that hypothesis before. 
If you will give consumers, as they come to the car dealership, a car that is more convenient than a gasoline car, that costs less than a gasoline car, by and large, they will buy it. At which point, they will be willing to pay the same amount of money per kilometer to drive that car as gasoline, as petrol, in the station. Now, everybody goes like this, sounds logic, yet every attempt in the past has gone against that hypothesis. We figured out the car is limited by the size of the battery as a result of the fact that it's limited by the size of the fact the battery. Let's build a small car that will be a bit lighter. Let's give up two seats, make it tiny, sort of like a golf cart, only with roof. Um, and then it has limited range to drive, but because we put the battery inside and we make a small number of them, it will cost $40,000, $50,000. And so we asked the consumer to go buy a car that is less convenient and costs more. Then we got surprised by the fact that they just didn't do it. Very few of them did, and we got surprised by the fact that there was no adoption, which was proof to the fact that everybody wants to buy oil. Hence, we got to stay on oil. We came back with the exact opposite set of questions. How would you make a car battery, much like the one that's depleting from my jacket? Sorry. How would you go on the car that goes on a battery that's limited by today's science to about 120 miles, 100 to 120 miles, that would still be more convenient than a gasoline car? As you can see, this is a fractal of questions that we started to unfold over the last four years. And we found out that the answer is actually in infrastructure. Much like every solution that we know today that we use on a day-to-day -day basis, the answer comes in the form of infrastructure. We didn't start with Google. We started with fiber in the ground. We didn't start with cell phones. We started with towers. We didn't start with cars. We started with gas stations before major adoption has happened. And so when you start thinking about it, why would we get a new form of transportation to be the prevailing form of transportation without any infrastructure to support it in the ground before we start? Now, we know the limitations on that car. We figured out you need to be able to create more convenience than gasoline car. And so the definition of convenience came to us in the form of the opposite of inconvenience. When you buy a car, you want to drive it all the time everywhere you go. Otherwise, you would use a bus or a train. The only inconvenient moment you have is going into a gas station filling up your car with petrol. Is it petrol or gasoline here? Petrol. You fill it up with petrol. How many times do you do that? When you ask most drivers, they'll tell you roughly about once a week. And so the num number, the magic number, is 50 times a year. When you ask them how long does it take you to go through the gas station, the petrol station, they'll tell you about five minutes. That's a lie. It's about seven to eight minutes. But we forget the entry, the exit, the credit card, and the ice cream moment. Because those are good moments, they're not bad moments. And so we remember five minutes, 50 times a year. And that became our bar. We have to create a car that will stop for less than 50 times a year in less than five minutes. On a battery that can take you about 120 miles, about 200 kilometers, 160 to 200 kilometers. And we came out with an answer. I won't go into all the details, but it actually is a dual strategy to bring energy into your car. The first is the longest extension cable on Earth. It connects the grid that brings electricity to your home and your work and to downtowns everywhere to the parking lot. It's the last foot that was missing. In a sense, wherever we park a car, we will have a charge spot. So that when you stop your car, you plug your car in. And when you come back to your car, magic happens. It's always full. It's not a very high-end magic because it's called the socket. We've seen it in the home. It's a very secure one. We make sure that kids can't get electrons into their body using the same cable. And we make sure that we know how to flatten the curve on loading so that when all the cars plug in at 8 o'clock in the morning, lights still stay on in the building because we flatten the curve and who gets to charge when. But by the end of the day, what we created is an edge to the existing grid that makes sure we can charge all cars so that when you come back to your car, it is always full. Imagine that contract with BP or Chevron or Exxon, that whenever you park your car, there'll be a truck that will zoom in and fill you up. 
That would be a good contract, right? That means we need to solve for the other situation, the exception, which is the long drive. The drive that I go more than 200 kilometers and I don't want to stop and charge for about two hours, which is what today's electric vehicles have asked you to do. Because if you stop and charge for an hour or two hours, that's a bus ride, that's not a car ride. If you do it every 200 kilometers, it's annoying. And if it's annoying, it's not convenient, and so you will not even consider buying that car. And so we figured out the second way to put energy into the car is to switch the battery. We actually took that technology from about two centuries ago. When you wanted to take a horse ride from one place to another, you would go on the carriage, your horses would ride really, really fast, you would get to a stop, they'll switch the horses, and you keep going, instead of feeding them and waiting for about four or five hours for them to rest so that they can keep going. And so what we figured out is we need to switch the battery. How do you switch the battery? You come into a station, it looks like car wash, your depleted battery goes out, a full battery comes in, and you keep driving. That machine, which we imagined two years ago, has actually been engineered and demonstrated in Japan two months ago, and the amount of time it takes to do that entire switch, entry to exit, is 40 seconds. You sit in your car, your dashboard becomes a retail spot so you can order your sandwich and your bottle of Coke, and when you come out a minute later, you're on the road again. So if you want to go 600 kilometers, you need to do two spots, two stops, it'll take you two minutes, it's actually shorter than the one gas station, and if you're driving with kids, you'd actually need to stop at least two more times for the other tank we can't take care of. In other words, we have given you more convenience than gasoline. How often would you stop to switch the battery? Probably 10, 15 times a year. Less than the number of times you will stop for gas. It's the times you will drive more than 200 kilometers one stop, non-stop. How many minutes would you spend? Less than five. The combination of the two, charge spots plus gas stations, costs roughly the same amount of money to build for a country or a region as gas stations used to cost for cars. In other words, the cost of distribution of energy is less than the cost of distribution for petrol today. So we got convenience. How about the price of the car? One of the things that we've done is we've taken the price of the battery off the car. It's not your battery. In effect, it's a mini crude oil well that gets consumed over time. It's a consumable component, not a component of the car. And without that component, the cost of an electric car, bill of material today, roughly around twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000. Logistics, advertising, marketing, dealer's margin, you name it, those cars will be roughly in the $20,000 US dollars range, which by the time 2012 we launch across Australia, I would assume that uh, it would be less than 20000 Australian dollars, given the currency fluctuations around the world. Um, with that in mind, we actually have a very interesting car. Not only that, most countries around the world have created an incentive plan to get manufacturing to high volume. Because we're starting from absolute zero in a market that makes about 50 to 70 million cars a year. And so to create an incentive to generate the first cars in the world that go electric, governments around the world have put an incentive plan in place. I'll give you a few examples. France, 5,000 euro per electric car. US, $7,500. China, $9,000. Japan, about $10,000. UK, about 5,000 pounds. Every country created a different incentive plan. In some cases, it's a bonus to the guy who buys the car. In some cases, they put a tax if you picked the wrong car. The ultimate tax system was the Danish one. If you buy an electric car, no tax. If you buy a gasoline car, a petrol car, 180% tax. In other words, if you want a sedan in Denmark, it will cost you about $50,000 to buy, $55,000 to buy the sedan. If you want an electric sedan, it's about $20,000 to buy. And it's sort of an IQ test. They want you to move to Norway if you pick the wrong car. So we created a more convenient car that is actually cheaper to build. We didn't build the car. We don't make the car. We went out to the car companies around the world, and the first one to pick up on this idea is Renault. 
Renault came up and originally thought this would be a great experiment. Roughly about two, 3,000 cars a year in Israel. That was the first country that said, let's go do it. There's a great story behind that, and I'll tell you that in a second. But they thought it's going to be 3,000, 4,000 cars at best in Israel. That's the amount of cars they sell every year in Israel, Renault cars they sell in Israel. Once they realized the pricing model and the price differentiation, it is now a car that's slated to sell about 150,000 in the next three, four years. The second car, the upgraded version, is already planned to sell more than a million cars in the first five years. And it's the first mass-produced electric car in history. What does it mean, mass-produced? It went through the entire cycle of production, through the entire industry, sourced from various different places. All the components are made in mass production, in high volume. And the first car was actually put together about a month ago, and we drove it. It drives twice faster than its sister, gasoline sister. It has acceleration that is actually pretty dangerous for most young drivers. It has absolute top torque. Torque is, like, is what you feel when you get planted into your seat at zero kilometers an hour as you press the pedal. It makes no noise, so we're going to download drive tones into it. You'll be able to pick the sound of your car. Imagine driving a Renault car but making the sound of a Ferrari. That will cost you more per kilometer, by the way. <laughs> but you're able to create a new experience with that car, one that is better and cheaper and more convenient than today's cars. So we're coming to the last question in this entire equation. If you're willing to buy a cheaper car that is more convenient and pay only what you pay for gasoline, can we fit the cost of the battery and the electrons and still make some margin for the people who give you the infrastructure, the new electric kilometer company. You see, when you go to a petrol station, you don't buy petrol. None of you collects petrol at home. There's no petrol tasting competition. We buy kilometers. We buy four, five, six hundred kilometers every time we go into a petrol station. We got addicted the day we bought this shiny object with four wheels. And we buy kilometers at whatever price they ask us. Remember last summer, we went into the petrol station, the price was what? A buck fifty a liter. Anybody here complain with the attendant that it was much higher than they used to be and they're not willing to pay that price? Do you know how much fluctuation in kilometers happened in Australia during the summer of 08? Less than 1%. There is no substance in the world that has higher addiction. If somebody raises the price on Coca Cola by a factor of three, we'll switch out. Even milk will switch out. Water, we'll switch out. Petrol, we're stuck. Why? Because petrol has the biggest monopoly on Earth. 99.9% .9 of cars in the world can only take liquid molecules to drive. And the option is not to buy it or not to buy it. The option is to get to work or not get to work. And so as a result of that, what we do is we drive, we pay about four or five dollars more at the peak of price, and we stop buying Starbucks to compensate. The alternative between driving and not driving becomes the alternative between driving and not buying something else. And as a result of that, economies collapse. How much so? In the aggregate, the G20, in the last 12 months, have saved 1.5 trillion dollars on oil imports, which just happens to be the exact amount of money put in the G20's collective stimulus packages. Oil, the economy. Oil, the economy. That's the equation we have right now. Now, let's look at the cost of electric driving. The cost of the battery divided by the amount of kilometers it could drive, roughly about 400,000 kilometers per battery pack, plus the cost of clean electrons, only clean electrons, windmills or solar, to create absolute zero carbon footprint to drive these cars is five US dollars per kilometer. Sorry, five US cents per kilometer. I apologize, I keep doing the same thing. It's US dollar cents per kilometer. Um, five cents a kilometer, US dollar cent per kilometer, multiplied by about 12 kilometers per liter is roughly 60 cents per liter. Anybody here knows where to find 60 cents liter? Now here's the interesting number. 
that five cents in 2011 numbers becomes three cents in 2015, becomes one and a half cent in 2020. Much like any consumer electronic device, it goes down a curve which cuts in half every period of time. The historic curve has been half every four to five years. And so the price in 2020 is one and a half US cent per kilometer. Let's assume technologies on the car side improve roughly the same way they did before. By the way, I don't know if you know, efficiency in Australia over the last decade improved by 1%. Not per annum, per decade. So let's assume we go 40, 50, 60, 70% better on kilometers. We go to 20 kilometers a liter on all cars in Australia. At one and a half cent, we need to look for a 30 cent liter at the petrol station in 2020. Anybody wants to take bets? Now, what does that mean? It means that there is a huge margin somewhere between now and 2020 on a per kilometer basis. And now comes the interesting part. That huge margin is roughly in a tune of about 10 to 12 to 13 cents per kilometer. There will be a day you will go into a petrol station to change batteries, but when you go buy the car, before you go into the petrol station, they'll ask you how many years do you want to lock your price per kilometer or per month. And if you'll say six years or five years or seven years, depending on the car you choose, they'll give you the car for free. How many of you want to buy a gasoline car right now? How many of you think they can sell that car in three, four years time? See, that's the amazing thing about this industry. If you don't think you can sell a car, you don't buy it. And if you don't think you can sell a car four or five years out and you don't buy it, car companies should stop designing them five years ago. It's a very long, long, long range industry. A car that will start design today will only be on the road in four years' time and will actually only be sold because it will be leased for the first three years in seven or eight years' time. In other words, anybody who looks at the car industry needs a crystal ball that is eight years long. Anybody here wants to bet that a free electric car will lose to a petrol car in eight years' time? That's the wrong bet to take. The threat of such a change in the industry impacts globally a collective industry of cars and petrol and all the ancillary businesses around it, from insurance to radio to food and gas stations, that aggregates to $10 trillion a year. There has never been a $10 trillion a year shift in the history of economy. And it will happen faster than anyone believes. Why? Because this industry will tip on expectation, not on delivery. Banks will stop financing cars. Leasing companies will not be able to raise bonds. These changes will happen so fast on the expectation of global delivery. And all it takes is one country, two countries, three countries to prove that it happened. And after those first two, three sites have happened, there is not going to be a place in the world that will not want to go off petrol as fast as possible.